All right. Well, we are here today with uh, Craig Northey, and Craig is a founding member of the renowned Canadian rock band Odds. Formed in 1987, they crossed over into radio success, platinum awards, and Juno nominations during the mid-1990s and have maintained their vitality to this day. Craig is also known for his work as a film and TV composer, Kids in the Hall, Corner Gas, Hiccups, Young Drunk Punk, This Blows. Uh, Craig is a serial collaborator. (laughs) That's a great term. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Some of the people he has been a musician with and or made albums with and or written songs with are Stephen Page, Warren Zevon, Strippers Union with Rob Baker of the Tragically Hip, Roseanne Cash, Colin James, Jesse Valenzuela, Gin Blossoms, Glenn Phillips, Jimmy Rankin, The Art of Time Ensemble, Adam Levy, Widemouth Mason, Jeremy Fisher, and The Waltons. That is quite a CV, my friend. Oh, what do you do? <laughs> you just just keep moving ahead <laughs> the best you can. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Tell us your story briefly for any listeners who might not uh, know the full Craig Northey story. Tell us a bit about who you are, your journey in the biz, how you got where you are today. Sure. Uh, as fast as I can, I'm, I'm from, I grew up in Port Moody, BC. Mm-hmm. Uh, my mom's a musician, just like in your family. And, and uh, she's an orchestral player, a violinist, violist. And uh, so that's where I started when I was three or four on violin, viola in Victoria, BC. And um, stuck with that till I was about, till rock and roll seemed a lot more intoxicating. I was still in the Vancouver Youth Orchestra at the time, but was teaching myself how to play guitar with all my friends. And um, they're around 13 or 14, somewhere in there. And, uh, and then I figured, Hey, Muddy Waters doesn't need to read music, so I <laughs> I bailed. But I'm I was I am glad to this day that I have theory and a background in in music in a legit way. Um, yeah. And uh, then it started in bands, you know, like we like a lot of people did in those days in basements and grotty spaces, playing with my friends, and uh, I was in a bunch of them and then I met the guys who are who've been my bandmates for the last 32 years for the most part uh, at least Doug Elliott and uh, in the late 80s in the scene in Vancouver realized hey we were the weird guy in the other bands we were in and would fit together a lot better if we just formed up and uh, <laughs> and that sort of led us on a journey and it kind of connected me to the rest of the world and to other musicians and to people who wanted me to try other things in music. Yeah. So here on the Vocal Lab, Mm -hmm. we aim to sort of shine a light into the industry through the lens of what I know now that I wish I'd known then. Yeah. Um, With that in mind, if you were starting your career over again, what would you do differently? Oh, boy. I don't know if I do much differently. I don't, I never think in terms of a career, which is probably a common thing that you hear from people. I don't, I just follow the path that's in front of me and say, is that fun? Is that something I want to do? And Mm -hmm. I do it. And I think when in our 20s, when we had a band that we all realized was something special when you have a connection with the other people and the music you're writing is is something that's better than everything else you've done you tend to start to pour it on you start to think about what do we need to do next what's our strategy for breaking out of this place and getting people to hear this music because it that's that's a tough part of the equation yeah so i think other than that period where i was really where we were really concentrating on how to do that. What, what was our, and we can get into it. It was an elaborate strategy. Um, then other than that, the rest of the time I've just been going, does that make me feel good? Does that represent what I'm my soul or what I'm interested in doing? And I decide in that millisecond. And usually the answer is yes. And I've just move on it. 
So I don't think I would change anything about the way I did it. I think being driven by that um, inner voice that says, yeah, that seems like something I want to try, then you start to realize your career isn't something you define as much as mm. something that um, can happen to you and can be good for you if you say yes to the right things. Yeah. So that's been a more of an instinctual process than maybe rather than a... Yeah, like parenting. A, uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, there's lessons you can get on how to uh, help you raise a child. But in the end, a lot of it is, this is happening right now, and I don't know anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> I have to try. I, yeah. I don't have a choice. Yeah. Yeah. So, I don't know, in answer to the question specifically, I don't know if I'd change anything. Um, but we'll probably get into the the hard parts about mm -hmm. what what went down. And that probably, my next question was going to be, what did you do right in your career specifically? But I, I is there anything you want to add to that? Uh, I, well, what I, I think I could probably damn myself a few times along the way where <laughs> I thought I should be thinking about a career, shouldn't I? What should I do now? Should I stay? One of the di dilemmas I've, I had at one point was, whether to concentrate on my film composing career and leave the rest behind, because I've watched a lot of people do that, leave their band career or their performance career alone. And I had mm -hmm. to make that decision. And I decided, no, I want it all. I don't want mm -hmm. to do that. And I'll accept the, the lesser in each if I have to, so that mm -hmm. I can do both. Um, that's probably uh, the only time I had to think about a career in a way. Other times yeah. it was, hey, I have no money. <laughs> <laughs> How do I get money? <laughs> I need it now. I forgot. I forgot all about it. I need it. Um, <laughs> so we are, you, you actually made reference to this a second ago, we are in an industry that sees like wildly differing, differing uh, levels of education and theory to supplement talent. Yeah, Some have formal education and some completely self-taught musicians. Mm -hmm. um, so do you want to talk a little bit about what your musical education looked like and how that really has impacted your work? Sure. Um, it was that childhood passion for music that that drove it. Like I would, as a kid watching my mom, who I really took after her in mm -hmm. terms of my path, I, I, I loved going to the rehearsal. She's a symphonic player and I'd sit with my Hardy Boy book at the back and <laughs> want to play the timpani mostly. But just mm -hmm. that, that was my daycare. I didn't have, she didn't have the resources to have daycare. So there were all these little kids at the back of the rehearsals. And uh, so it was just like, following what your parent did. And mm -hmm. she suggested the path. She initially taught me and then she passed me off when I was too difficult for her because parent child relationships mm -hmm. are tough in that teaching thing. So she passed me yes, off to are. the next great teacher and the next great teacher. And um, that was a formal classical education as a child up until I was 15 or 16, I guess. So I took, you know, it was, it was all laid out for you, that mm -hmm. that path. But I wasn't as passionate about that music in the end. Mm -hmm. But by the time I had moved on to rock and roll, I, um, which started when I was six, I knew that I wanted <laughs> to play rock and roll instead of this. But I did the other stuff anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I got a couple grades in theory and... Um, and I understood how to read music and those kind of elements. Yep. And it's not like that's like riding a bike. It does disappear. I have, I've had to revisit it and, and work on it more later it on. Is a muscle. And I'm still a terrible sight reader. And I have a problem transferring the muscle memory from one instrument to another. I can't really play piano. I'm, mm -hmm. But I can look at it, figure it all out, and pick away. 
and <laughs> just very slowly, <laughs> very slowly, and on my own time. And I, mm -hmm. that's why I have this laboratory here so that I can make my own mistakes. Yeah. And did that, like, I know experientially speaking, whether you have any formal knowledge or theory or not, that can be a blessing or a curse in rock and roll. Yes. Right? It, it can be both. Is that a different thing when it comes to, like, you've parlayed your career into um, a lot of film and television and scoring and that kind mm -hmm. of thing. Is that a different beast in that world? No, or is it because still quite oral. It is. And I think that's where I was going to expand that explanation is that when I started to learn guitar, I did it all by ear. I did it mm -hmm. on the old put down the the LP record and lift the needle, put it down, put my mm -hmm. hands on the guitar, figure <laughs> out the song by by just moving my hands around until I figured out how it worked and talked to my friends and said, have you ever seen this? What you do with your hand? And they go, oh, this is much easier if you just move that finger. And mm -hmm. it's, so there's a social network. There's the collaboration with other uh, people when you're learning to play and you're doing it all by ear. And so you learn that, what does my body want? What do I want? And I can already hear it. And you, your, your, your ear, when it hears a song, says... I wouldn't have done that. I would have made this kind of a sound at that point. I wouldn't have gone to that place. And you realize, oh, I have a, a sensibility. Mm -hmm. And you use your ear to lead you. You use the melody to lead what the chord should be underneath. And you, you're doing it all by ear. And I think that is employed in the film work, in everything I do. I do it all by a sense of what I want to feel. Mm -hmm. I, I, I feel the flow of the melody and the theory just helps you eliminate notes that are unnecessary or don't serve that purpose. It helps you weed through it and understand this would actually focus what I'm doing. I like that perspective. Yeah. So as you've got, I mean, you talked about the sense of community um, and collaboration when you're learning. Mm hmm the next question, I'm. you're welcome to name whoever you would like to name, but it, it's really less about the names and more about the actual relationships. What have been the most important relationships in the course of your career? Wow. Well, my mother first, you mm -hmm. know, um, for, for providing something to look to and some, a lot of albums, you know, yeah. a lot of, it was all classical records, a few from international places, a African guitar record, not any rock and roll much at all. I think one uh, Roy Orbison record snuck in and that blew my mind. And, and then, of course, all the Beatles was a, mm -hmm. my first record that, of my own. But um, my mom, uh, inspirationally, and then uh, my teachers that I discussed on violin and... Uh, but then it becomes your friends. It becomes people around you who know that one thing and you pass it back and forth. So they may not ever know more than you. They know mm -hmm. something different. They looked at it a different way. They found a secret. And uh, now there's YouTube for people yeah. who, who don't have that. And especially through the pandemic, if you want to figure out some of those secrets, it's pretty easy. There's so much information. It was like a secret art when I was a teenager, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm older for all you people out there. <laughs> and so, <laughs> uh, it was in the seventies, you know, the early seventies, the late sixties, trying to figure out, um, stuff. Uh, I suppose I started in the early seventies, so I won't date myself that far back, <laughs> but you, yeah. 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 So I was living in the sixties, uh, <laughs> that it was more of a secret. It was harder to do that. You had to mm -hmm. go hang out at the music store, literally go in there mm -hmm. and see someone else pick up a guitar. If you didn't, I would go there on weekends and some some teenager who was older than me would pick up a Les Paul and just rip something. And I'd go walk right over there and say, do that again. You know, it was sort mm -hmm. of like hockey players watching somebody make a move and go do that again. And then you imitate it. 
Mm-hmm. So it's kind of, that's how you learned. Um, so the friends, so back to your question, that, that did that with me. And then once you're in a band and you have, uh, like Stephen Drake, who was in The Odds with me, I learned immeasurable amounts about how to play the guitar from Stephen, just by mm-hmm. watching, just and by him saying, oh, no, I'm doing this. Or us writing parts for each other or in the early days. Yep. Uh, I would say, I'd like you to play this. And he'd say, yeah, modify it, make it his own. And he'd say, I'd like you to play this. And I go, wow, that's something I wouldn't have thought of. So then you start to think of that the next time. Oh, that was an interesting thing he did. And that's how you learn by osmosis. Yeah. Uh, so those are the, imp- the important ones. And it continues to this day from everyone I play with. I learned something. And you've collaborated with a lot of other artists over the years. And mm-hmm. that has to come from a place of community and mutual respect and support rather than competition. Mm-hmm. Do you want to talk a little bit about what your experience has been there and how you think we can actually foster a more supportive community in an industry that can tend towards being a more competitive industry? Right. I never got that sense of competition. I think that uh, it's a competitive industry, I suppose, because you're all trying to get somebody to pay attention to you. Um, Mm -hmm. but, uh, I never got that sense amongst other musicians. I never got the sense that there was a competition between me and them. And perhaps I'm naive, but I think we, we used to make a joke about that, that the public thinks that all the bands hate each other and the the Oasis and Blur thing is how it works for everybody. But I always was supportive of everything I saw. I mean, musicians can be a little bit catty and judgmental if if they're if you don't push the right buttons for them as a musician Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. i always had such a respect i think growing up with musicians for how hard the work is and what they do that um i i just felt like i can learn something from that person Mm -hmm. how to foster that attitude in the community um I don't, I don't know. That's fair. Just, just, I, I think, I think for musicians to just realize that music is music, that it's genre wise, what you do, uh, your, the intentions that you have are pure in, in what you do. And I think for me, authenticity is important. It's quite mm-hmm. an important part of my own music listening. Um, and who I am, if, if I sense that you're in it for the music, then I really love it. I don't care what kind of music it is. If I mm-hmm. sense that you're in it for a career first, then I'm really not interested. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it sort of turns me off the music. Um, so that, that's, that's important to me as a listener. And I know it's different for everybody. Some people couldn't care less about that factor yeah. as a listener. My next question is going to be about what do you think creates a career with longevity? Mm. <laughs> that actually <laughs> dovetails nicely into your last answer. <laughs> right. And whether you think those things are mutually exclusive. <gasps> yeah. I honestly am really happy that I'm still doing this. I'm mm-hmm. really I'm really happy about it and somehow baffled at times. Um, I think that that attitude that I just described probably mm-hmm. is a reason that I'm still doing it. Mm-hmm. And it's really hard to keep me down. I, I don't see everything as a failure. If, if, if a record comes out and nobody hears about it, it's not really anybody's fault. It's the fact they didn't get to hear about it, but 10 people did or mm-hmm. a thousand people did and they, they sort of stick by you. It's um, it's okay by me. I, yeah. I think people, when sometimes it's funny to be in a band like Odds, where um, you're kind of a cult thing in a way in a lot of markets in the states and in places in Canada. People see it in in a, any number of ways, but you're not 
you're not a Celine Dion level or a mm-hmm. Bo- Michael Bublé level or Brian Adams level. You're at your thing. And they say, well, I wish you guys could have really just been successful. You know, some people will say that to you. And I say, well, it's funny. I don't feel, I do feel really successful. You know, I yeah. feel that I, um, that I've had a really great time, you know? Yeah. So, um, it's how, how you look at it. Well, and how you measure success. I yes. think that actually brings up a, a really important point about how you measure success. And one of the things that I really appreciate in in all the pieces you're describing about your musical journey is that it's really clear that first and foremost, you're there because of the joy that you get in your relationship with music. Yeah. That's that's the starting point and the end point and everything else is sprinkles. Exactly. And I think um, it's, you know, an age old cliche that if you, you'll never work a day in your life, if you choose mm-hmm. something that you like, it can be terrible. And I can not notice sometimes, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and other times I can really notice, you know, mm-hmm. I've made choices along the way about what I like to do and what I don't like to do and what I'm good at and what I'm maybe not good at because I I've tried everything yeah how did you transition from that um and I I I know like in terms of a timeline it wasn't you did one and then you stopped and you did the other it really was um meshed and Mm -hmm. and crossed over but that transition from being a live performer into working in in film and tv and scoring um how did that how did you uh move from one to the other into the Mm. other yeah uh in the mid 90s after the band had had some success um people started to come forward to me with ideas and um, I started a career for a while as a staff writer as a result of Roseanne Cash just phoning me uh, Mm -hmm. out of the blue her and her husband John Leventhal were fans of the album we had made and said could you write a song for me and I said yeah sure and it worked out and um, so that sort of began, a, oh, well, maybe I can do that with other people. I'd really only done it in the bands that I was in with the person in the band that I was in. Maybe I can apply that same stuff to that. And that began that side chain of events. And almost at the same time, uh, our friends, you know, our band was really into comedy. And... uh we made friends with the kids in the hall, which is a mm-hmm. comedy troupe from Toronto who most people know about by this point. Uh, and they they had come to Vancouver and were playing our album on their first tour as the walk-in music. And Byron Lonneberg, who worked for us for has worked for us at that point for ages. Uh, was over there working on the show and said, who decides on this music? And uh, their sound guy, Al, said, well, they do. They love this record. And he said, well, I work for this band. Do they want to meet them? And he said, yes, bring them down. And there was two show nights, so that's how we met. Um, mm-hmm. We were next door. Our, our band room was in the basement of the Roxy on Granville, and they were at the Vogue, which is next door for all you people who aren't in Vancouver. And we all met that night, and we've been friends ever since. And um, so we started ideas of collaborating, and they made a video with us. They made another video with us. And then in 95, when they got a feature film, they asked me, can you score films? And I said, yeah. (laughs) I've never done one in my life. (laughs) So... There became a critical and harsh learning curve mm-hmm. right away. And that's how I got involved. I just threw myself in the deep end and almost died. And it was just a <laughs> the movie I made called Brain Candy 
my first feature film for for them for paramount was is legendary for its troubles and uh so on, on top of their interpersonal troubles and and everything that was going on making that film that was difficult i was sitting in the basement of the roxy uh, how, figuring out how to do this um and at that point it wasn't you had a digital wor workstation and you somebody sent you a a quick time movie over the internet and you synced it up to your pro tools and everything worked you could work in sync all non-destructive everything happened and then you sent it back to them after you finished it wasn't that easy it was <laughs> way more complicated with with the machines and the technology and fedex and um anyway that's how i got involved in that and i did a couple more films for that bruce mccullough directed afterwards and um and then i started there's been gaps where i stop mm -hmm. for five years not scoring anything and then it gets busy and then i do do it again and so uh brent butt said oh you did that and he was a friend of mine another comedian and he said if if i ever get a show will you do music for it and i said yeah sure we were just drinking beer and then years later, he phones me and goes, remember you said that? I said, did I? <laughs> and and sure, I'll do it. So I did uh, some theme songs and for Corner Gas and then ended up scoring their movie and their animated show and stuff and hiccups. And so it's all based on those two camps of people really mm -hmm. starting everything for me. Comes back to relationships, right? Yeah. And I figure yeah. if it's the odds that started that, why stop that? You know, that's yeah. that's where the good stuff's coming from. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about your songwriting process? I know that's a big, huge, vast um, question. Sure. By process, meaning I'm sitting here in this chair. I got nothing. What do I do? Because I feel <laughs> like I would like a song. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, some writers, they have a routine and they sit down every day and they, you know, they spend four hours writing every day or they, you know, they write every day. Some write mm -hmm. when the muse hits some, it's a different yeah. mechanical process for everybody. Uh, some write on one instrument and not another, some, you got it. You yeah. Know, whatever. What's I your generally, process look like? I generally don't write every day. I, I come up with something every day, usually. Mm -hmm. Um, that I, I footnote and put away. So I collect mm -hmm. language in a book and uh, are collected on my phone and then in a book or something like that. So I'm always collecting stuff and I'm collecting ideas. So I might pick up a guitar somewhere and clumsily play something and hear something different in it. And I go, oh, make mental note. I make a, a note of it. So I'm collecting these fragments and uh, as a, you know, parent, you know this one too. I I've raised with my partner three kids, and um, when that started, it was all simultaneous with all the stuff that was super busy in my life, uh, uh, with odds and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. So, like the Raymond Carver thing, you just kind of um, carve out these little pieces, whether it be at two a.m. or <laughs> wherever to to create and you have to force yourself so mm -hmm. you learn yourself you learn to write through the shit and uh make some bad stuff and don't worry about it and then out of that bad stuff comes something else so i'll just sit down in this chair and i'll go through the fragments or i won't i'll just pick up something and uh usually it's on guitar sometimes it's uh just a beat or something that inspires mm -hmm. me and i start fooling around with it and then I can stop it all and go back and make a, a legit song structure, or I can just riff on something for ages and divine something out of the air, basically. Yeah. Uh, that's my process, usually on guitar. Um, I have other things here, but sometimes it's, it's, a, it's a keyboard part or something. A lot of times... What I do, as I say, in, as it said in that bio, that I'm a serial collaborator, that means some inspiration comes your way. Yeah. 
somebody says, hey, I got this idea, but I can't figure out what to do with it. It's these two chords and this, this little melodic fragment. So I, I go, great, that's great. That's something to start on. And usually in a collaborative writing process, that's the first thing you say after all the coffee and getting to know somebody is, hey, did you have an idea, have something you wanted to do? And they say, yeah, well, I had this thing here. It's usually good. It's usually your job as a collaborator is to listen and say, that part, that part, that's mm -hmm. awesome. You mm -hmm. don't have to say that part's terrible. <laughs> you say, that part's <laughs> awesome. And and the person goes, really? I didn't, I, that part? Because I thought was the part I was going to throw away. No, 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 that's the best part. And then you start to say, and it could use this. Don't you think it could go here? What's this about? This, these mm -hmm. notes make me feel like I'm in the Gobi Desert. So let's let's do something that sounds warm, you know. So you, what's the story behind this? Mm -hmm. I guess I think it's probably a fairly universal process. Yeah. How do you? approach the the concept of storytelling in your writing and and performing but um i mean as a as a voice teacher i talk to students often about the way that um storytelling impacts a connection with an audience mm -hmm. because i firmly believe that it does um, and I think that shows up in both the songwriting and also in, in performance, because I think those are both storytelling vehicles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do you want to talk a little bit about that concept? I like that question. It's an awesome idea. And it's, it's sort of critical to what I do, is because my stories are, are never explained fully when I write mm -hmm. songs. And I, I think makes my lyrics weirder for people and mm -hmm. something to interpret. But um, I'm off, uh, like, say, uh, I'll just give an example of my relationship with Rob Baker. We've made a few albums as Strippers Union, uh, some of the odds guys, some hip guys, and Rob, but basically it's Rob and I writing songs. And almost all of ours are story songs, but Mm -hmm. people aren't necessarily going to figure out what the story is. We know what it is so that we know what we're telling. And I think that adds something to, it adds something we weird and wonderful to the tune in that people are look uh, are listening into the story and not necessarily following it, but they're trying. They're trying, they're mm -hmm. active listeners, in other words, to try to figure out what it's about. And we just... You know, we just say, well, what if it's a guy and he's reincarnated as an elephant and <laughs> the elephant is having a bad day because it's too hot and this dude is riding him and he's talking to the trainer and saying in, in his mind, he's trying to tell the trainer, I got your back. I'll, I'll let this happen, but it's really a bad day for me. That's, that's our story. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and Rob will go, well, how can we make it funnier? Can the elephant have diarrhea? You know. <laughs> and and so we we trade it back and forth and we just keep saying, How can we make it funnier? And uh, how can we make this more pathetic? How can we make this so sad? We we have these agendas of pushing the envelope and punching it up for each other. Mm -hmm. You know, well, that 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 joke didn't quite land, so let's change those two words. And then everybody listens to it and says, this is a beautiful love song. <laughs> and you go, thank you. Thank you. Because you never said it was an elephant, you know? You right. You never said it was a relationship song in the end. So it's kind of, it's that weird with what we do. Mm -hmm. But we're deadly serious about that elephant. We're deadly serious about what's going on because we're creating this world. And um, that's often when I look back at all the things I've written, they're, they're a little bit cryptic that way because I'm not explaining everything. I don't think it's your responsibility to. Although mm -hmm. Harry Chapin or great story songwriters do. 
they do explain everything in a story song. You know? I think there that that's very much two different styles of songwriting and it um creates two different styles of listening too. Mm-hmm. One where you are um you know, the story is very much spelled out. And mm-hmm. I think that as listeners, we um, listen envisioning ourselves as the main character. Yeah. So when the story is very much spelled out, we are envisioning ourselves in that story, step for step, word for word. When the story is... Um, cloaked in metaphor and fragmented and you're only getting bits and pieces, it creates a much more active um, listening relationship because it, it you're now having to create your own version of the story. And it means everybody's version as a listener, everybody's version is different. Yeah. I don't know where... The instinct to do that with me came from other than my love of modern fiction, my love of the Beatles and their drug period. Mm. (laughs) So that's, you know, I was more in love with Revolver and, you know, from, from Rubber Soul onwards where the lyrics were like that. It wasn't please, please me. It wasn't want to hold your hand. I was blown away by, you know, the more psychedelic stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, Leonard Cohen once said, I'm going to get it wrong. I'll just paraphrase. He said, I love pop music because it's the last place you can be obscure. Mm -hmm. And uh, you'd think, oh, coming from him, that's, that's really strange, but it's, it was true. It was a place you can um, give depth, like you were saying something to, to go looking for. And oftentimes I don't know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. It just feels good. And I think that's the window in for people who don't listen the way you were saying, where they're trying to figure out the story. Some people aren't. They're Mm -hmm. just listening to the beat. They, it's doing something to them and they hear the three words in the chorus that, that just stick in in the earworm and they discover the rest later. Maybe never. Even, even the guys in my own band, they, they'll come to me. 20 years after playing a song for 20 years and say, you know, I just realized how good that was and what you're saying. I go, thanks. <laughs> you know, it's, it was more important, the feeling that the song gave them. Yep. Yeah. And so it's. It, it actually astounds me when I listen to music with my husband, who is a guitar player and, and singer. Um, but he he hears the song as a whole, and he hears the guitar, mm-hmm. and he hears the melody, but he doesn't hear the words. He cannot tell you what the words to, other than maybe like the hook line. Mm-hmm. But many, he, I'd he can't say, tell you the words to the song. I'd say many people like uh, Susan Rogers, who who worked with Odds on a couple of albums, brilliant producer, engineer, um, has written a book. She's a PhD in, in um, neuroscience and in uh, cognitive behavioral stuff in, yeah. with music. And her book is called This Is What It Sounds Like. She, she took from the Prince tune because she spent a lot of her career working with Prince. Yeah. And it is brilliant. If, we, if you want to go into this topic of how people listen, uh, the people who don't hear the words, the people who are focused on the story, the people who are focused on authenticity, who are focused on technique, who, who want uh, a lot of noise. It's why people listen in different ways. And it helps you by, by giving examples and getting something to listen to while you're reading the book, mm-hmm. explore why you like what you like. And why someone else likes what they like, and why everything is valid, and it's a, a beautiful book. So I, I encourage everyone to pick it up. That's fascinating, and I will link that in the in the show notes for people to 
um, find that easily. Um, that's fascinating. I'm going to read that. It'll really help you with your with your your partner because it's uh, yeah. It it's uh, you realize I got to let them off the hook. Yeah. <laughs> I I totally get it now. <laughs> How do you find that writing for film and TV differs, or does it, from traditional songwriting? Hmm. It's, I've often described it as the, it's songwriting, but the inspiration is completely provided for you mm -hmm. by some, some sort of stricter guidelines because somebody's given you a story They've given you the visuals for it. You're not imagining them or projecting an imagination of the situation through the song. You're supporting that complete idea. And so it's a matter of finding stuff that honors it, knowing when not to, to do anything, uh, mm -hmm. knowing when you're discussing it with somebody, what needs support, what doesn't, how to... How to mm, um, we're talking about writing score rather than songs for, for movies. Um, it's kind of a, I don't quite understand where the instincts stinks come from for knowing, in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, you can study it, and I'm sure, um, and I see people coming out of programs for composition that have the toolbox. Mm -hmm. I learned it the hard way by applying it and getting it reject like there's a lot of rejection there's way mm -hmm. more rejection in film and tv music than you would even imagine you really have to get used mm -hmm. to that so when you apply it uh, i i like it but no you know someone <laughs> will say that and that just took you 10 hours or yeah. a day or whatever and uh okay well let's next how, yeah. how about this yeah closer not quite, you know, and it, it's just, it either works or it doesn't for that, yeah. for the, that person. So you, you get used to that. So that's the difference in songwriting because you get really excited about the song you wrote. If you're by yourself, you get really mm -hmm. excited with your, the partner you're working with, if you're collaborating and then it comes, goes out into the world and somebody likes it, you know, your mom might like it, your, your mm -hmm. dad, somebody likes it. And it works a different way. You, yeah. you get all of that over with really quickly knowing, well, that's going to die and just go in a box in a black hole <laughs> onto the next one. <laughs> so it is that thing where it is provided for you and you're honoring that. That's the mm -hmm. big difference. Mm -hmm. But you do, you do uh, to the second part of your question, you employ the same instincts. You mm -hmm. employ the same melodic instincts and understanding of what that, jump to a sixth does for the romance of the situation or whatever you're doing, you understand which stuff as you do it is going to work and um, in the same way that it works in a song. Yeah. Everybody's routine in the studio looks different, right? Mm -hmm. Some artists write in the studio, some don't. Some people have preferences about um, the order in which things are tracked. I know, like, my brother often records his drummer last. Uh, I heard Paul McCartney always tracked bass last. Um, I don't know if that's correct or not, but I did hear, hear that somewhere along the way. Do you want to talk about your process in the studio when you're making a, a record or recording a song? Um, do you have any specific things that that factor in? Do you sure. always have to light candles or hang twinkly <laughs> <Yeah>. lights? <laughs> no, I think at this point I've tried almost everything. And I think with uh, with our band, it, it happens any number of ways. Yeah. It could be that I'm over at somebody's house and we get an idea and it's just two people playing together unamplified and somebody turns on their phone and we record a piece of it. And then mm -hmm. that's replicated when we're all together and built on it can be um everybody in a room playing and then you just hit the record button uh, which is this place that i'm in now it's set up for that 
And then it can be somebody put together an entire track, all of it's done, and we're all going in and playing it the way we would play it. Sometimes over what they did to to sample drums, and then the drums are replaced by Pat. Um, it can be uh, two of us in this place, and that's the basis of the track. You know, we put it down, that's the basis, and everybody is on it. And it could be any of the instruments. Mm -hmm. um, Murray on guitar and, and I, or Murray playing piano, and uh, Doug, Doug and I playing bass and a drum machine. You know, it can be any of those things to create it. Um, so the answer to the first part is, I don't really specify which way it's going to be that it has to happen. I know mm -hmm. in the odds, though, Doug does like to redo his bass last. So mm -hmm. he'll do it with Pat, and it'll be awesome because they've been playing together since they were uh, 18 years old. Mm. But, uh, and often for, for any other situation, that's fine. You know, if they go mm -hmm. in as a team on a session, the two of them can just blow your mind immediately. So that's fine. But when it's our own band, Doug goes, give me another run at it. And then all of a sudden it becomes something extra magical. So that that's one thing I've noticed over the years that that happens often. Um, in terms of collaborative songwriting, a lot of times it's online now too. Mm -hmm. Somebody will send me something that's quasi-complete or not. Uh, when I write with Rob for Strippers Union, Oftentimes he sends me, he sends me 50 instrumental pieces that are complete. And wow. I just get, it's, it's such luxury. I go, no, that one, no, no, no. That one. I, yeah. I got something in there and I just lay it up in my machine in the studio, that instrumental. I start chopping it up. I start singing on top of it. And eventually words appear or maybe I've got some in my fragments I talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the way those songs happen a lot of the time. And then we get together and it can, can flex some more. Mm -hmm. um, and those albums, the first two were done live off the floor, basically, with a band after that process. And the second one was more of a pandemic album where we were able to get the rhythm section done here. All of it was done at his place in terms of the other tracks. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that kind of covers it. I mean, Stephen Page and I have written a lot of music together. A lot of it is when we're together. We're just hacking around. One yeah. of us is sitting there with a guitar and the other one's got a bass or something and we're, we're just uh, talking and we record it to a little machine like a uh, a phone mm -hmm. and then it expands from there it gets left with one person oftentimes I'll send him uh, a track with a groove and bass tr bass line and maybe a chorus maybe mm -hmm. something some idea I have as far as the beginning of the story as we spoke of then it comes back finished <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> It's, I mean, collaborative songwriting is, there's some magic to it that way, right? When you... Yeah, when you moments. find people that trust you and you trust mm -hmm. them. That's the best. Yeah. Hey guys, thanks for joining in today. That was Craig Northy of Odds. And uh, that was just the first half of my interview with him. I can't wait for you to hear all the rest of everything he has to share with us. So tune back in again on Thursday where you get to hear everything else. We'll see you then.